It's 12.30, it's Wednesday, and that means it's Washington Walks Webinar Wednesday. Here we are again in our DC History series. Today, welcoming uh, one of my favorite colleagues, David Luria, more on him in a minute, and another of my favorite colleagues, Washington Walks guide, Christina Bauer. But want folks to know that um, Tonight, we have one, the second to the last of our DC and the Movies webinars. This one is gonna feature the 1987 film Broadcast News. James L. Brooks, Holly Hunter, William Hurt, Albert Brooks, no relation to the film director. But let's get started right now with what we're calling Hands Across DC. And this was the inspiration of my colleague, David Luria. David, welcome. We have, you too. Hi, we have been colleagues in the DC tourism industry for two decades. We started our little businesses about the same time. David, before photo safaris came in your life, what were you doing? I was a photographer for, a professional photographer for a couple of years and before that, I did a whole career in international nonprofit organizations. I worked for CARE for many years overseas in Colombia and Panama. And I, I did sort of administrative work in nonprofit organizations. And then how do you go from that to being the guy, <clears throat> folks who are participating, if you are ever around DC, could be along the National Mall, could be at the Capitol, it could be anywhere in Washington, DC. And you see a group of six or seven folks with tripods, or maybe all holding up their iPhones, smartphones in the same direction. Look for the man that you're seeing on your screen right now in that very jaunty hat. <laughs> and you're gonna be seeing David Luria leading one of his photo safaris. How did you go from international nonprofit work to leading photo safaris, not just in Washington, outside the nation's capital, even outside the United States? Uh, well, I, I lost a job that I had. It was a very nice job, but it got eliminated due to budget cuts. And so that happens to a lot of people in this town. So I decided to take up my hobby and make it my profession of photography. And I became an architectural photographer and travel photographer and um, started taking pictures for local magazines. And, and then after a while, I thought I was good enough to be able to teach other people how to do that. So I started up this photo safari in 1999. And, We've trained about 38,000 people since that time. We have 11 other instructors, all in different specialties of, of um, travel and portraits and street photography and animals and zoos and all sorts of things. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. And you are so generous with your talent and your know-how that you told me yesterday and Christina yesterday that you actually created a sort of how-to manual for folks who want to start photo safari operations in other parts of the country. That's correct. And about 20 other cities have taken up on that. And, and you'll find them now in most, most major cities in the country have somebody like me who's a local person who knows where all the pictures are and takes people there and shows them how to take the better pictures and especially like training them for travel photography. Mm -hmm. So David, we're going to see all the images we're going to look at today, all these images of hands on statues, famous, less famous, are all going to be images that David has taken throughout his time in DC. And then we thought it'd be really good to have some context and some backstory for those statues. And for that, I turn to my invaluable colleague, Christina Bauer, who has been a Washington Walks guide for many years, but she also is a tour guide with other companies and does a lot of tours of the National Mall. So she knows what we're gonna be looking at really, really well. Chris, before tour guiding, what were you doing? <clears throat> I was involved as a federal contractor. Uh, my background is in library and information science. So, um, I really enjoy the aspect of tour guiding that involves research uh, into the material that's going to be, um, you know, uh, looked at or visited. And uh, I think that's one of my strengths. So that's I what I was doing. 
So mm -hmm. folks, how this worked today, David sent me about, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 images. And we figured we wouldn't have that much time to look at all of them. So I sent them on to Chris and she selected about seven that she thought would be good. Some you all will know who are participating, you'll recognize these, but others are gonna probably be puzzled by. She knows all about them. So I'm now gonna stop sharing our welcome slide and I'm gonna move to the images. And we'll start our first one. And folks who are participating, you're just gonna get the pleasure at your home on your own laptops or PCs of seeing the slides and you guess on your own if you recognize what this is or who this is. So here is our first one. It's obviously a hand, but whose hand is it? And full disclosure, I got this one wrong when we <laughs> <laughs> rehearsed yesterday. Um, um, so Chris, you tell us who this is and then David will tell us about how he got this shot and optimal ways to get shots of this particular statue. Okay, well, first I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the idea of hands uh, and, and what they tell us, human hands. And we know that uh, artists throughout history have been fascinated with the human hand. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci studied uh, anatomy to try to learn better how to uh, convey uh, the human hand in a realistic way. And uh, so we know that hands can show so many different uh, poses, so many different positions, and different emotions. So uh, they can be relaxed, they can be tense, they can be gesturing, uh, they can be grasping, uh, they can be gentle, menacing, aspirational. And uh, the human hand can tell us a lot about the actual person to whom the hand belongs. And so today, as we go on this safari with David, I'm, I'm really going to be interested to see um, why he chose certain, uh, certain hands and uh, how he photographs them and uh, how we as uh, tour guides can uh, uh, interpret perhaps meaning, uh, derive meaning from the hands and also how we can, uh, and from David, you're going to hear uh, ways to improve your photography. Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that too. Okay, so, so this one looks very relaxed and yeah. open. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's more to it. Is it relaxed? <laughs> so <laughs> did we have did we have folks who guessed what this is? Someone wondered if it was FDR. Okay, no. Okay, no. this is the hand of the wounded soldier at the Vietnam Women's Memorial which is on the grounds of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So um, uh, this is the complete uh, image of the complete sculpture here. And actually, uh, we can only see two of, two of the nurses, but there are three. And these three nurses are uh, represent women who served in Vietnam as uh, nurses, medical technicians, physical therapists, uh, physicians. And we know about 11,000 uh, actually participated in the war on site in Vietnam, but somewhere between 150 and 200,000 others um, served during the 16 years of the Vietnam War in, in other places around the world. So here we see uh, the nurses, um, up surrounding this wounded soldier. And uh, you take a look at his hand. And Carolyn, if you want to go back to the first slide uh, so we can focus on that hand a little bit more. There you go. So you can see um, it's limp. It's sort of dangling down. It's open. It's in a way relaxed. Uh, limp as it would be if you were seriously wounded. Uh, many people, after they look at the entire sculpture, assume that this soldier was mortally or fatally wounded, but um, the sculptor, Glenna Goodacre, 
uh, said no, that this, this soldier survived. And so uh, what we can get from this is that it's an image of hope and compassion that uh, commemorates the service and sacrifice of women, uh, but also gives hope that help is on the way and that uh, caring individuals are present uh, surrounding this wounded soldier. David, this is a beautiful photograph. It's taken at nighttime. Yes, Carol. I always thought it was really challenging to take photographs at night, but maybe I am not giving myself enough credit for being able to take photographs at night. How would you approach this at night? And why did you choose to photograph it at night? Uh, the lighting is very nice at night, uh, Carolyn. You have lights, uh, stanchions surrounding the statue that light it up and send rays of light down to the statue. Uh, you can do that with a, a phone. You don't have to have a camera to do it. You can do it with a, one of the newer model cell phones. Uh, it's best to do it with a camera and a tripod because the light is low. But the nice thing about this statue, it's very powerful. It's very emotional. Um, uh, I guess it was based on Michelangelo's Pieta, where Mary's holding Jesus, you know, but this is a very nice, and you can do it from different angles. You can do each figure individually, each face individually is very good. Uh, the one looking up at the sky, some people think she's praying, some people think she's looking for a helicopter. You can, you can judge it any way you want, but close-ups of the faces uh, make very good photos too. And you go all around the statue, you could spend a good hour taking pictures of this statue and still not get it all. So it's a great place to do. Uh, nighttime is good and early morning when the light is low uh, and coming from, the, uh, coming from the east makes a nicer time to photograph it also. Uh -huh. Do I wanna be standing up to take this photograph? Actually, no, to... Carolyn, thanks. Uh, it, it is always better on most statues to go from a low angle and shoot up. You can see that I was pretty much at waist level of the soldier. Uh, so I was kneeling down and shooting up. And it makes, uh, usually for most statues, a more interesting picture when you get down low and shoot up. For example, the Three Soldiers Memorial next, next door there, Three Soldiers looking at the wall. If you get down to their shoe level and shoot up, it makes them look taller and more impressive. So uh, getting down low and close is always the best way to go. Chris, Glenna Goodacre, <clears throat> who sculpted this, she passed away recently. Mm -hmm. That's right. If people are impressed with this work of hers, are there other statues that she designed and sculpted in Washington? I don't um, know, actually. I'm actually not sure about that. Perhaps some of our uh, participants can can enlighten us on yes, that. I know that know. throughout the country, uh, she has uh, uh, produced many other uh, sculptures that um, are publicly displayed. So, yeah. Let's look at our next set of hands, pair of hands. Slender, <clears throat> relaxed. Okay, I see the answers are coming in. Yep. Oh, this is fun to see them. <laughs> oh, Phyllis McGuire, you got it. FDR at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial. Exactly, and uh, these, I, I really like these hands. It's, uh, you can see, uh, FDR had very long, slim uh, uh, fingers, and uh, I think if Carolyn goes over to the next slide as well, we can also appreciate more of the context of this for those who perhaps aren't uh, familiar with it, but here we, we see uh, FDR in a very uh, familiar pose. Uh, this sculpture is in the third room. Uh, of the outdoor memorial, which is divided into four rooms, one for each of his four terms. We see him seated here, which is a very typical pose for FDR because 
as uh, many people know, uh, he suffered from a paralytic illness at the age of 39 and never again walked unassisted. So uh, most of the time when we see him in public photos, uh, he is seated and uh, often at a desk. And so his hands actually gain more importance uh, because of that. And uh, he is always thought of as a very animated person despite the fact that he wasn't actually uh, walking around. So it tells you a little bit about how he was able to use his hands uh, to express himself. So um, let's go back to the slide of the hands again, Carolyn, because there are some details there that I think uh, are of interest. And um, especially uh, the ring on his lower hand, on the pinky finger, that sort of oval shape there, that is a, a signet ring. And in the early 20th century, this was an item that a wealthy person might wear, a man might wear. Uh, and in this case, we know FDR wore this ring throughout his life. It was an heirloom from his father uh, engraved with the Roosevelt family crest uh, on a uh, stone called a, a bloodstone, which is sort of a dark green with uh, little specks of other colors in it. Now, not every man would be comfortable wearing a pinky ring. So I think that this uh, tells us that uh, FDR uh, projected uh, uh, self-confidence and he had a certain image of a man perhaps a little bit set apart. Um, we also know, you know, he frequently wore a cape, which was easier for him to manage uh, due to uh, his paralyzed legs. Um, and. Uh, what we can't see here, at least not in the photo, but perhaps I'll have to take a look at this the next time at the scope, I'm, I'm actually there, that from the time of FDR's marriage uh, to Eleanor 1905, just underneath this ring that we see here, he also wore his wedding band. So we would have put the wedding band on first and then the signet ring over that. So um, I feel like um, these hands, which are very graceful, um, and um, the ring and how he wore it basically uh, shows a man uh, of style and grace and uh, a patrician uh, who really valued uh, his family heritage. Um, so the sculptor is Neil Estern and this, um, uh, rendering of, of FDR was um, uh, finished in 1997 when the uh, memorial opened. Right, and here it is again in its full context with the first presidential pet to <laughs> ever be memorialized. It's Fala, his faithful dog who traveled with him and was a presence at the White House everywhere in all the rooms that FDR went. David, this is another striking photograph that you've shot in black and white. So what time of day did you go to photograph this and why? Well, again, uh, Count, nighttime is very good for a lot of these statues uh, because the way the Park Service has arranged the lighting on the statues very artistically, uh, you look at the nice shadows on his face it's really very good portrait lighting that they put on there. So half the face is lit and half the face is a little bit dark. It makes a very nice portrait uh, style of, of lighting. So that can be done again with, with smartphones uh, these days, the new phones are, are very good at night or a camera on a tripod or even a camera handheld if you raise the ISO. A low angle like that uh, makes the statue again look a little taller. Mm -hmm. It's also good in the daytime usually in the late afternoon sun uh, is another good time to photograph this statue, but it's a great place to, to take that whole memorial itself makes for very good photography, a lot of fun. Because there's all those different rooms and the sculptures in the different rooms are, and the water features are really, um, right. a really beautiful addition to that memorial. So it sounds like you're suggesting to people that we need to be really aware of time of day when yes. we're going out to shoot photographs. Is there a time of day we kind of should avoid if we want to get the best photograph? Yes, Carol, in noontime, when the sun is high in the sky, it's very bright, very white. Um, it's not the best time to take pictures. So 
early morning, late afternoon, what they call the golden hour is the hour after the sun comes up or the hour before the sun comes down. Uh, th that's when most of the National Geographic pictures that you see have that soft golden light with the long mm -hmm. shadows. That's the best time to take pictures, not, not in the middle of the day. And then nighttime is also very good because of the lighting that you have on these statues. Uh -huh. If I sign up for one of your photo safaris, then I may have to be prepared to come out into DC really early in the morning. That's right. We actually start on the National Mall about 5.30, 5.15 in the morning sometimes. About wow. 40 minutes before summer, <laughs> which is a beautiful. Wow. Love wow. <laughs> Here's our next one. Okay. So this is kind of our surprise entry. <laughs> Last hands. Okay, looking for answers here. I wonder if anyone has a guess. If you don't want to guess, folks, you can put it in the chat. Sure. It would be interesting to see what people and might this, think. All of these are in DC. Look at maybe this one is not on the mall. This one is in Northeast DC. This one is at part of a, a site, a, a kind of historic religious site. Oh, we're getting some really interesting uh, suggestions here. Oh, yes. We've got yeah. St. Anthony. Nope. Red Cross is a really good guess. Um, that, that's a very worthy guess. It's not that. It's not anything at Gallia Depp. It's not the Pope. Oh, here's a couple okay. with Franciscan Monastery. I think we're getting warmer. We're getting warmer. Very good. Let's just show them the whole thing first. There we sure, go. Sure, sure. There you go. And we'll go back to her hand. Sure. Um, yes, when I first saw this, I had no, no idea who it was. Actually, I've never been to the monastery, so that's a place I need to get to quite quickly. But as I looked at David's image of these hands, it was really kind of fascinating to me because notice that the outer hand looks sort of big and the fingers coming down over it looked very small. And at first I thought, are these, the, you know, is that a child's hand? Is this really two people? But it turns out, no, it's one person, but it's a very small person. Um, it's actually a, a teenager uh, named uh, Bernadette Subiru, uh, born in Lourdes, France in 1844. And as a teenager, uh, she, had uh, several experiences, some, some sources say as many as 18 experiences in which she reported that the Virgin Mary appeared to her. And of course, you know, she was a young girl, uneducated, uh, from a poverty stricken family. At first, no one believed her, but then, you know, it, it, interesting things started to happen uh, uh, in the town and uh, people did start to uh, realize that there, she had some special power. And uh, so what happened was that uh, she later went into a, a convent, became a nun, and um, they created a, a, a chapel in Lourdes uh, near this one of the sites where the Virgin appeared to her. Uh, there was a, a spring there that has um, you know, healing medicinal water coming from it. And so people started pilgrimage, uh, pilgrimages to that site to both drink and to uh, wash in that water, uh, which had uh, apparently had healing properties. Now, the statue is only four feet tall, but uh, Bernadette herself was only four foot seven. She was a very tiny woman. Uh, and they attribute that to the fact that she had had a sickly childhood and um, grew up in poverty with not very good food. So I, I think this is fascinating. And she's gazing off at a statue that's in a grotto in like an enclosure. Yeah. She's gazing at an image, a statue of the Virgin Mary. So that's why her eyes are, are looking out that way. And she's kind of enraptured here. Yep. 
So David, you obviously early on realized that the Franciscan Monastery in DC's Brooklyn neighborhood was going to be a rich source of a visual source for photo safaris. It has been ever since we've given a walking tour of the Brooklyn neighborhood, it's been part of that walking tour. Um, it's worthy of a tour all, all itself because not only can you walk through the gardens, and this is a lovely shot to give you an idea of tulips, and I think that's maybe azalea in the background, um, but the inside of the basilica there is also uh, multi-level and beautiful. And a site, this is a site that a lot of folks don't know exists and maybe don't realize that they can visit. But in fact, the Franciscans are welcoming people with open arms to come and spend time at this site. So David, do you have a photo safari that's just about the monastery? Yes, we do, Carol. We go there several times a year, just for all the reasons that you said. First of all, it's one of the lesser known places in DC, the sort of off the beaten track. But most people don't don't know about it. It's been there for like 115 years, <laughs> and it's just absolutely gorgeous. It's free. It's open to the public. At tulip time, they have beautiful tulip gardens that come up, and in the summer, you've got roses and all sorts of other flowers there. They have their own gardener who takes care of the gardens. Uh, this is in the lower uh, garden uh, there at the monastery, and you can see again that I got down low to her knee level and shot up with the tulips in the foreground to make the picture more interesting than just shooting from a standing position. Uh, afternoon sun is the best time there because the monastery faces west, so you always want to go use the sun to light up your structures. West-facing buildings you do in the afternoon and east-facing buildings you do in the morning and south-facing buildings you can do all day long okay. in the northern hemisphere and north-facing buildings are always in shade in the northern right. hemisphere so what do you do then what do you do so you just have to like think about that the sun lights things up much nicer than anything else does and she faces west also and and as you say she's looking up at the virgin mary and her face is lit up because uh, uh because the sun was shining down on her from the west Nice. Let's see our next set of hands. Oh. So easy. To us. <laughs> to I us. I expect <laughs> other folks to. <laughs> I expect other folks to. Okay. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, this is fun to see all the, all, everything. Oh, coming in. I, wow. it's bingo, bingo, bingo. <laughs> Everyone recognizes this. Okay, so right. let's give full context, but we'll go back. <laughs> and then this and this this photograph, David. We'll come back and talk about it. But wow. Okay, so of course we're we're at the Lincoln Memorial uh, in this uh, set of images, and uh, uh, Lincoln's right hand is what uh, we're focused on. Uh, the artist is Daniel Chester French, and of all uh, Americans, it is probably the most well-known of all American sculptures. So uh, this, uh, this right hand uh, was basically uh, modeled by uh, French, uh, and he stated that he wanted this image to portray uh, mental and physical strength. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion, of course, and a lot of urban legends around uh, the Lincoln Memorial and various uh, symbolism that people have ascribed to it over the years. But um, generally, uh, what the understanding is that this, um, this hand, the right hand, is uh, compassion. And then the left hand, and if we can see a little bit of that in the larger image, Carolyn, uh, which we can't really see, but if you look closely, and for those who know, uh, the left hand is clenched, like in a fist. And um, that's basically thought to uh, illustrate his resolve that uh, represented the firmness of his intention that the union should prevail, the union must prevail and uh, the United States must endure, and that restoring the Union was paramount. 
And uh, the compassion part, um, in, in, in the other hand, in the right hand, uh, basically had to do with the fact that uh, Lincoln in his speeches and in his uh, other um, public uh, comments uh, that we know about was very, um, very adamant that following the war, uh, people in the South, both civilians and uh, those who had participated as soldiers, that they should not be punished. They should not, uh, you know, be uh, basically um, put down because of their leanings. He wanted to bring everybody back together. He wanted uh, to restore, um, you know, the union, both as a governmental entity, but as a country. What's significant about, um, he, he's sort of seated on a type of throne almost. What's significant about the, uh, the columns or the sides of the throne that his hands are resting on? They look like um, something that you often see in Greek or Roman um, war imagery. Okay, those are called fasces, F-A-S-C-E-S. Um, and basically, if you go back to the first slide, Carolyn, you can see it a little bit, I think, uh, closer to the detail. Uh, the guides will know about this, but basically the idea is that if you have just one stick, you can easily break one stick. But if you bind a group of sticks together, a bundle of sticks together, then you have something that cannot be broken. Uh, and that's what um, these uh, symbolize in this in this context. So strength, the union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. David, how much in your image here is um, the Park Service helping out with lighting, and how much is it your know-how as a photographer? <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, here again, this memorial is really best done at night. You can do it in the daytime, but he's always in shade all day long. So at night they turn the lights on and it beautifully lit because again, the, uh, the person who, or the people who did the lighting know something about portrait lighting. So one side of his face is brighter than the other. That's called a main light and a fill light when in portrait uh, photography. And they've done that very well on this statue. Um, he really looks magnificent in all white on this white throne looking out over the reflecting pool at night. So the best time to go is at night. And again, phones do a fine job with that as any camera does. They don't usually allow tripods in there. So you'd have to handhold your camera. Oh, okay. um, on this, on this uh, photograph, you can see that we place the statue to the left of center. That has to do with composition, with something called the rule of thirds. You don't want your subject in the middle of the picture. You want him on the right side, the left side, top or bottom, but not in the middle. And here he is facing to your right. So he's in the left side, left half of the picture. And then you have a nice line made by that fellow who's doing the photography on the lower right from his shoe, from his right shoe, uh, up through his camera to the people and draw a straight line right up to Lincoln. In other words, he's pointing at Lincoln and the people form a nice composition line yeah. from, his, from his body right up to the statue itself. So, uh, And he's following your guideline to Neil to take a yes. photo of the statue. <laughs> Get low and, close. and he's shooting them from the waist up, which is really all you need when you do people. You don't have to do people's whole bodies. The people's lower halves are really not that interesting. It's the upper half of the body that uh, that makes a nicer picture, and that's what he's doing there. <laughs> Chris, it looks like on the um, where Lee, Lincoln is seated, it looks like maybe his coat or cloak is draped at the back of that. Is that what that is? Yes, I believe that's right. Yeah. The other thing that I think is really interesting here to point out um, is that as a tour guide, when uh, I'm with folks and we go up into the memorial like this, what strikes them the most is the size of it. And what I like about this photo of David's is that makes, this photo makes the scale very clear, uh, how massive the statue actually is, which is 19 feet tall. 
Now, Brenda Turner, I just saw her message. She says that's an American flag draped over the back. Oh, so, okay. thank you for that, Brenda, one of my fellow, fellow very well informed guides. But um, mm -hmm. I really, you know, this whole idea, so many times you see people taking selfies in front of this. Well, it doesn't really make sense because it just totally distorts the scale of the thing. This is such a wonderful photo because you really do have that sense of how enormous this uh, representation of Lincoln really is. It's, it's fabulous. I love this picture. If he stood up and faced out toward the Capitol, how tall would he be? Uh, I would say uh, what I've seen is 28 feet tall if he were actually standing. And of course, he was very tall. He was a very tall person. Uh, yeah. As we know, he was six foot four, uh, one of our tallest presidents. Right. Okay. We're not going to give any hints. <laughs> okay. I think the tour guide should be able to get this one too. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Another bingo. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Everyone is guessing this one correctly. <laughs> well, let's okay. Well, well, that's good. It it's good that everyone, it's, yeah, it's, it's good that everyone knows this because um, as you realize here, those hands are pretty far above the ground, right? And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, Martin Luther King at the Martin Luther King Memorial. And um, this is uh, basically um, what we call um, the um, Stone of Hope um, feature of the memorial. So um, it's the only memorial, only major memorial in the National Mall uh, dedicated to a private citizen. Um, our other memorials tend to be uh, dedicated to presidents or military officers. Uh, but here we have uh, the first African American in a major memorial. The memorial was dedicated in 2011 by our first African American president, uh, Barack Obama. And the imp impetus for this memorial, for having it constructed, uh, began with members of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, which was the first uh, uh, for, uh, college fraternity for African American men. So one of the things I'd like to uh, point out to people, and, and Carolyn, if you would go back to um, the whole the, the whole statue or the whole uh, sculpture here, and I shouldn't have just used that word. Basically, what I like to tell people, and this is for tour guides, this is very easy to illustrate to your students. I, I always ask one of the students to come and stand next to me, and I then proceed to explain the difference between what we have here and an actual statue. Uh, to, for something to be called a statue, you have to, it has to be um, rendered in 360 degrees so that you would be able to walk all the way around it and see the, whole pers the person's whole body. That's not the case here. This is more of a very high relief uh, kind of situation where the image is in the background are essentially fused together. So the question always is, okay, you know, what is uh, what is King holding? And uh, generally thought to be um, his eye of the dream speech, perhaps. But more importantly, for our purposes today, this idea of his hands and uh, the pose he is in uh, with folded hands that always represents a certain kind of resolve. Uh, a certain, uh, some people would say maybe even stubbornness or determination. Uh, but I think um, any of those, uh, you know, reactions uh, are, are appropriate. And uh, I think uh, people, this is another situation where if you walk people through the memorial uh, from just behind there, which is called the Mountain of Despair, and you walk through the mountain of despair, of course, what you're looking out at is the tidal basin. And you actually have to come in and turn around to look up at King. And that is quite an amazing experience for most people too. They're like, oh my gosh, because he's just, you know, again, 30 feet tall, towering over them, this massive presence. People really like this. Mm -hmm. 
David, I'm going to go back. Is this, when you got this image, is this a detail from a larger um, image of King that you took? Uh, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, this is a, a crop part of a larger image. Um, and this, again, is another statue that you want to do at the right time of day. Um, you go there and you'll see that he faces east. The statue faces east. So early morning, is a good time to go at uh, what they call civil twilight, just after the sun has come up. You have that sort of nice deep blue sky uh, and the light nicely on the statue like that. So always, it's always important to use the sun uh, when you have it to light, light things up. It also is very nice at night because it's all lit up at night. So uh, both times, nighttime and morning. Uh, he's facing the tidal basin, as Christina said, and he's facing the Jefferson Memorial um, I like to think that he's almost sort of talking to Jefferson and saying, hey, wait a second, uh, you left a lot of us out of that Constitution and Declaration of Independence, only three-fifths of us. Uh, he, I'd like to point that out to you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another way of, everybody can interpret uh, statues differently. That's one interpretation that I have. Um, a lot of tour companies in Washington um, bicycle, Segway, on foot, on a bus, their most popular tours will be ones of the National Mall memorials, the kind of iconic sites. Is that true mm -hmm. for photo safaris? Yes, yeah, we take people to the most popular places, but we like to take them to the off the beaten track, as you do, uh, so that they discover things that they just didn't know about. Franciscan Monastery is one, National Cathedral is another place that a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know. Do you go to the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Brooklyn? Yes, yeah, lovely, just beautiful. Now there's one thing I want to point out in this photograph of the MLK Memorial that I was a genius. I thought David Lurie is a genius. This happens to be taken in the autumn. And I know that because to the left, the russet colored leaves are on a Japanese cherry tree. Japanese cherry trees um, are prominent in the landscaping of this memorial. They bloom early April, often, and that April 4 is the day that he was assassinated and he lost his life. So the designers, the memorial, like the idea of something being in bloom and living and vibrant around the time that he lost his life. But the cherry trees also look very beautiful in autumn, and this image shows us the gorgeous, gorgeous color. And I remember being in a Destination DC meeting of all our tourism colleagues and you announcing that you were going to start doing a photo safari of the cherry trees in the autumn because they were so beautiful then. And you're right. still doing that, right? Again, and something people just don't realize, cherry right. trees turn all orange. They're just as pretty in the fall as they are in the spring. It's quite they really are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was an inspired idea. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, this is another easy one, I think. Sure. Yes, we may get, oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yes. We have to make this harder next time, Dan. No, <laughs> next time. This this is just <laughs> everyone knows what this is. We're, we're we're going easy on them this time, but so uh, it's okay. We, more, we have to get more exotic. <laughs> well, everyone who has, who has offered a guess, your guess is correct, Iwo Jima Memorial. Yes. Right. And uh, of course, Iwo Jima Memorial, that's more or less the um, alternate uh, name for this. Um, we know it formally as the United States Marine Corps Memorial. And uh, of course, uh, this portrays the um, the uh, soldiers um, planting the flag at the top of Mount Suribachi uh, during uh, 1945, toward the end of World War II. And uh, what you can see here uh, are these uh, servicemen grasping this pole. Uh, and of course, this is a great uh, view and, and David this is a magnificent shot showing how close emphasizes the fact that um, 
this was a representation of unity, of collaborative effort, of uh, collective purpose, uh, basically, you know, a band of brothers uh, striving toward the goal of raising this flag, which we uh, know then became a symbol um, of the United States and how um, these particular servicemen wanted to um, encourage uh, their fellow soldiers, um, their fellow Marines uh, in this battle um, and uh, not to give up. And we know also that this uh, flag was raised very early on uh, in that particular uh, battle that went on for, I think, about 45 days. And we also know that three of these soldiers, uh, who uh, the three of these Marines, and, and I guess uh, were di uh, died uh, during the battle, uh, only three of them uh, survived to come home. So, uh, David, I think you know people probably know the story, but I love the details that you have about how this came to be based on a photograph. Yes, well, and you must is, include include that you one, you've been to see the negative. One of the most famous photographs in in history, uh, uh, probably one of the best known photographs in history, uh, taken by an AP photographer named Joe Rosenthal whose job it was to take pictures for hometown newspapers of the GIs overseas and send them back to the hometown papers. That's how AP made its money, by being paid by the editors of these papers for pictures of their local folks in the war. So he's climbing up Mount Suribachi and a detachment of Marines comes up and he's saying, where are you guys going? He said, we're gonna put up a bigger flag because the one up there is a little too small and the Admiral wants a bigger flag. So we'll go, we're going to put that up. So he said, okay, I'll take a picture of you when you put it up. And then he went up and took a picture of the first flag being taken down and a sort of grip and grin sent to the uh, newspapers. And then he turned around and suddenly saw these guys with a pipe putting this flag and raising it up. And in one motion, he swung around with his um, uh, speed graphic camera and took about three shots. Um, two of them were ruined by light leaks uh, but the third one survived, and when the AP editor on the ship was developing it, he said, that's a beautiful image for all times, and he sent it out on the wire, and every newspaper editor in the country agreed with him, ran it at the top of the fold of their papers saying, Marines take Mount Suribachi. Um, it's a lovely work of art. You have that angled flag making an angle right down to the soldiers' knees and all that determination in their hands and their knees to plant this thing in a pile of rocks, not mud, but rocks. And uh, it's just a beautiful uh, determination of, of these soldiers to uh, take that hill and keep it. So it's a, it just a wonderful, wonderful photograph and became a 76 foot tall statue. <laughs> and you have been to New York City. Yes. Is it to the AP headquarters? and saw the original negative of the, uh, uh, of the thing taken by Rosenthal. And the flag itself is at the Marine Corps Museum in Quantico. It's uh, full of holes, uh, it's all windblown, and it's preserved behind glass uh, at the Marine Corps Museum in Quantico, Virginia. Now this memorial is very high off the ground. Um, we don't have, we can't see the size of a human being in relation to it, but we're, we're fairly small in relation to it. Is there ever a time when you wouldn't take a photograph, maybe from below, kneeling? Is it ever gonna work out well for you if you take one standing? Like maybe at this memorial? Well, certainly here, sure, you can shoot up because you are low to begin with um, and, and uh, using getting in nice and tight with your telephoto also makes good pictures. So not just doing the whole statue, but pieces of it like just the hands or just one face. Again, at night, it's even better than the daytime. At night, it's lovely uh, lighting uh, coming from the right side. And uh, each soldier's face is lit up. And you can use your zoom lens, either phone zoom or, or telephoto lens, and get each face individually and see the faces much more clearly at night through your camera zoom yeah. lens and in the daytime. They make great pictures. I think we have one more, right, Chris? We do. 
Okay, you all smarty pants out there. <laughs> What's this one? Smarty pants, smarty pants. I see some of my clients out there sending in. All right. Oh, good. Hey, go. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> oh everyone is just. Okay. And we thought we were now, okay, I like this. Christine is guessing the awakening statue. And that's a really nice tribute to that statue, which no longer is in the District of Columbia area. It is down at National Harbor. It was taken away from us. But I can really understand someone um, thinking that was part of the awakening. In fact, it is the Library of Congress, Statue <laughs> of Neptune. Right. This is, uh, this is the Court of Neptune. Uh, they're on First Street uh, at, at the um, west front of the Library of Congress. And uh, I, just, I just love this. Uh, it's so exuberant. And uh, I also included it because it is different from the other figures that we've looked at because it's actually not a, a real person. It's uh, the Roman god of the sea, uh, Neptune. If you are coming at this from Greek mythology, you would know this individual as Poseidon. But, uh, you know, people wonder, well, you know, what's this got to do with anything and why is it there? Um, the Library of Congress, of course, is uh, all about knowledge and information and the preservation of that. And uh, so many of the um, images uh, inside the building uh, harken back to uh, classical motifs and, and subjects. So this is very, very much uh, in the same uh, language, shall we say, of, of what goes on inside the library. But this figure, I mean, is amazing. Look at Neptune here. He, he's uh, very regal. He's incredibly, incredibly muscular. He's sitting on a rock. He's got that one knee out in front of him just with his hand and his elbow, you know, just across that leg. Uh, his subjects in his very lavish realm, this very Victorian uh, setting here, you know, sea nymphs, seahorses, serpents, turtles, frogs, and tritons. Uh, the tritons are these uh, guys right here with the conch shells. Um, they're half fish. And I love um, his hands and um, uh, Neptune's hands. Carolyn, if you want to go back to the, the hand picture that is uh, just, I mean, look at the detail here uh, on his hand the, and all the veins, the blood vessels, the musculature of his arm, and of course his knee. Um, and uh, I just I just think this is amazing. And the other thing from a tourist point of view is this is a very accessible uh, work of art. You can go right up to it. And um, the other thing that I think makes this very special is the play of the water. This is a very alive, very active, um, very sort of exuberant uh, place to take people. And, and I would think uh, from your point of view, David, the opportunities for great photographs here are limitless. Oh, it's great. Yeah, I mean, it, it faces west. The whole Library of Congress building and its complex face west. So we do our safaris there in the afternoon with the afternoon sun coming from behind the Capitol, shining on the library and on the fountain. Uh, so afternoon, I don't think it's lit up at night. So afternoon, Oh, it is. Is Let it me up you something? We oh, do a walking tour in October called Capital Hauntings. And the fountains lit up at night? Oh yes, it's so evocative. It looks, it looks a little eerie. And we have a ghost story that we tell, it doesn't have anything to do with Neptune, but about um, something about the library. So standing the group in front of the library, across the street from it, with this statue lit oh. up. And he looks a little bit you're not sure what to make of him at night. It's perfect. It's really perfect. <laughs> yes. Good to know. Yeah. So again, uh, a shooting from a low angle and um, and making him look even taller. You can see my camera is sort of at below his knee level there. So 
always getting down, get down low, get close, makes better pictures. David, tell, talk a little bit um, about how important it is to have a tripod with you when you're going out and you're purposeful and you, know, you want to take photographs that are going to make you feel proud. Is a tripod essential? But tripods always get better pictures than no tripod. I mean, a tripod holds the camera absolutely steady. There's no shake and the picture's always going to be sharper. They're not as necessary now as they were five, six, seven years ago, because the cameras keep getting better and better. They have higher ISO sensitivity levels, so you can take pictures in darker places at faster shutter speeds with, uh, with, uh, with less shake and less digital noise too. So both the phones and the camera technologies have been improving so much that tripods aren't quite as essential as they used to be, but it all, unquestionably, it's always better a tripod shot is always better than a handheld shot. What do you, when you're going out, um, say not as David Luria, the photo safari instructor, but you're just gonna go out, you're on a trip, um, you have a camera with you. What kind of camera do you use as your day-to-day -day camera? Um, well, I actually have a couple, but I, I use a, uh, right now, something called a mirrorless camera, which are they're smaller and lighter um, and a little easier to carry around. And I use one, basically one all-purpose lens, which is 18 to 400, which is very handy. It goes all the way wide to 18 and long to 400. So I don't have to change lenses that often. Uh, that's a handy thing to have. Um, but everybody's needs are different. Some people like close-ups of flowers. They should have a set special lens to do that. Some people like wide angles. They need a shorter lens, like a 10 to 20. Very good for architecture. So it really depends on what people enjoy doing. Uh, the phones are excellent in many ways. They make everything very sharp front to back. They're not so good at blurring the background as cameras do, uh, but it's all just sort of a personal taste thing in terms of what, what is uh, the best for the individual. If you are someone who kind of is day to day with their phone and their phone is their primary camera, mm -hmm. is it necessary for us to have special apps that we've downloaded and I have on our phone or is the equipment that comes or the technology that comes with the phone usually gonna serve as well? Yeah, some of the newest phones, the, the latest iPhones and the latest Galaxies, Androids, the Google phones, they're really very good. They just get better with each model because they cost more, but they, they do get better. They do more things and less need for apps. Um, you can, if there are other things that you wanna do, you can get, get apps. Uh, for different color balances and different things. But for the most part, the phone, the, the last two years, two or three years, the phones uh, are really spectacular and they do amazing things. You have been on such a remarkable journey as a photographer because when you started, everybody who came to you was bringing a camera that had film in it. Yeah. And then <laughs> we switched, transitioned to digital. And then all of a sudden people were carrying their smartphones and using those exclusively. You seem very resilient and you seem very optimistic and you've embraced all this change and you've incorporated it into your business, haven't you? Well, thanks, Carolyn. It's interesting that um, because phones have gotten to be so good and really better with each new model, um, I thought that they might put cameras out of business but the camera manufacturers themselves still are coming out with new models every year and the lens manufacturers are coming out with new lenses so they put their money on the on the bet that people are awakened to photography by their phone that the phone is a gateway drug to a camera <laughs> uh, <laughs> because oh my god look at these wonderful pictures i can get so they have awaken people to the importance of taking good pictures and making good memories. And I can do even better stuff with a camera than I can't do with a phone. So most people have both a phone and a camera now and, uh, and get, and the cameras themselves are getting more sophisticated and better quality with each new model. So it looks like they'll be around a while and I hope I will be too. I have no doubt you will be. One of our participants shared that she recently bought a zoom lens set that clips onto a cell phone. Yes. Um, 
She says it's fun to play with. It's perhaps not as obviously not as good as what you'd have on a camera, but sounds like something that she's enjoyed working with. It's Are you true. familiar and with those? Wide angle phones, wide angle lenses for phones too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good. Well, I want folks, I want to share um, one more thing with people. And that is, I want them to see your website, WashingtonPhotoSafari.com. Uh, and folks, if you're familiar with Washington Walks, you know that we have multiple walking tours. We have over 30 different walking tours. Well, Washington Photo Safari far, far uh, out be beats us in number of offerings because David doesn't just take people into Washington DC areas. He goes out of town throughout the United States and he goes out of the country on photo safaris. So you can take a river cruise with him in Europe. You can go to New York City. You can go to Montreal. Do you go into Asia? Have you gone to Asia? Not yet. Maybe in the plans. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping to come back with photo safaris as soon as the COVID era has drawn to a close, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, we're doing photo critiques of people's photos. In other words, the photos that they have already, uh, we ask them to send us 10 of their best pictures, and then, then I critique them uh, or online uh, on their computer while they're looking at them and see how it can be improved. So that's what we're doing now while people are still sitting inside. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, one last thing to show before we wind up is um, what we have coming next week. And that is going to be a talk, a presentation by my colleague, Sarah Schoenfeld, who is one of the founders of an organization called Prologue DC. And one of their major contributions and projects that they've done is the Mapping Segregation Project, which basically using mapping technology um, shows where rest racially restricted covenants were enforced in different neighborhoods in Washington, DC, early 20th century mostly. So she'll be talking about that. And then tonight at seven, we have broadcast news discussion with Hill Rag film critic, Mike Canning. Folks out there who participated, well done. You know your stuff. Thanks for being with us. And David and Chris, thank you so much for the expertise and knowledge and enthusiasm that you brought today. It was wonderful to have you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank all you. right. Well, folks, we'll see you all next week for the next one that we're going to be doing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.